Welcome to Barbell Logic Rewind. Hey, this is Barbell Logic. I'm Scott. I've got Matt with me. And today we're going to talk about supplemental lifts today. First, you got to tell us what those things are. They're not accessories. They're not. So when I think of supplemental lifts, I think of a lift as a variation on the main lift. Something that looks like the main lift, something that's not a competition squat, what we might call the competition squat, normal low bar squat, squat. when you would do it in competition. Mm -hmm. It's not that, but it looks like that. You know, any variation of a squat that is close to the main lift or a deadlift or any other lifts, right? So why would we do that? Well, for a couple of reasons. One is because we can attack weak points with it. Mm -hmm. One. So when we start to see places where form breaks down, we can concentrate on that specific area. We really do supplemental lifts for one of two reasons. One, is to be able to overload. So we, mm -hmm. some supplemental lifts allow us to lift more weight than normal because it's a partial movement. So think of a rack pull as opposed to a deadlift. Once you get decent at a rack pull, it's a partial movement. You can do more weight on a rack pull, theoretically, <laughs> than, yeah. than you could on a full range deadlift. So that's one reason. The other reason is because sometimes we actually do lifts which are a longer range of motion, mm -hmm. which use a little less weight, doesn't tend to beat us up as much also will attack, sometimes attack weaknesses, but also because it's a longer range of motion with less weight, it allows us to have the stress needed to disrupt homeostasis to drive the yeah. adaptation that we need, which is Just, to get stronger. Because right? work is force times distance. If we can make D go up, Correct. we can often make the F go down and still get more work. It's exactly awesome. Right. Like now, a deficit deadlift would be something like that. Yeah. So there are an infinite number of supplemental lifts that you could use. Now, what it's not is an accessory movement. So when I think of accessory movement, I think of a thing that might work the same muscles of the main lifts, but doesn't look like the main lift at all. So a leg press for a squat, right? That doesn't look like a squat. It still works a glute ham raise for a squat, like things like that. Those are just an accessory movement. And those things are just there to basically get additional volume in, also to disrupt homeostasis, but often they're there for hypertrophy purposes, right? That I can't, at some point, I can't just squat to get bigger legs, right? right. Or I can't just bench press to get bigger upper body or whatever and we use those accessories like the barbell row and the chin though to support our other work though of course but yeah but they don't look like anything else they are what they are so and they're those, also those are it's, it's hard to quantify how much an accessory lift makes your you know it's hard yeah. to quantify how much a barbell row makes your deadlift or even your bench press go up but it's easier to quantify how much a supplemental lift does and so i just want to talk to you about some of my favorite supplemental lifts today because there's so many of them out there which ones i think actually carry over the best to the main competition lifts. This may be out of order, but maybe this is more definition stuff. Would you call like chained work supplemental? Yeah, you would, of course. Okay. okay. Yeah. And we'll get there. Why I think chain work is good versus something else. So let's start with squat. What variations do I like on the squat? Well, there are several. Lots. There's not lots. There's lots you can do. There's yeah. not lots I like. Okay. Well, that's right. Okay. I, so I yeah, I, wanna be, I just want to be clear. So for example, let me give you one that's clearly a supplemental lift that I don't like. Front squat. Yep. I don't like front squat. It's too different. Too right? different. And so when we start thinking about the supplemental list, we're thinking about the spectrum of specificity. And a front squat is not very specific, specifically to what we do, to a low bar squat, right? right? It, is it, it still a squat? It's still a squat. But even if it was specific, I don't want them to do it because we fight knee slide knee in slide, our training so much. We want them not, to hold the knee back and reach right. back with their butt. And it's going to teach them the other thing. Right. It's, a, it's yeah, I don't like not it. Now, good. remember that supplemental lifts, too, like it has to be noted that I don't introduce supplemental lifts until at least mid intermediate training. So I don't even do it in early intermediate. I don't introduce it in Texas method. I don't introduce it in heavy light medium. It's not until after I get to that four day split. That's when I'm going to introduce that. And so, again, that four day split is going to look like you're going to have four days, two upper, two lower on the lower yeah. days. Day one on the lower day. So day one is going to be squat. And you're going to do a deadlift supplemental exercise. And then you're going to have a couple accessory slots in there, right? So you're going to do a squat. You're going to do some deadlift variation. Day three will also be a lower body day. Day three. Yep. And that'll be the deadlift competition deadlift and a supplemental squat. Now, usually the supplemental squat will be performed before the deadlift because we just usually like squatting yep. before the deadlift. It doesn't have to be. But you'll do the main deadlift and a supplemental squat. And then the upper body days are the same thing. Day two and four. So day two is bench press day and you'll do your competition bench press and you'll do a supplemental press and day four will be press day. And you'll do a supplemental bench and then you'll have your slots in there like barbell rows, chins, maybe dips, maybe, you know, line tricep extensions, whatever curls for the girls, things like yeah. that. Okay. So that's the template. Now in a future episode, we're actually going to talk about the four day split as from a programming perspective, but the four day split 
regardless of how you end up programming it, the template actually looks exactly the same. It almost always looks like yeah, this. Four day split. What are you gonna do? Well, here's what you're gonna do. You're gonna do a squat, and then when it comes time to do a squat supplemental lift, which is what you do on the deadlift day, these are the ones I like. I love a pause squat. Yeah. I think a pause squat works really well. You lower down exactly the same way you normally squat. You pause for two seconds. Stay super tight. Super tight. And what I'm looking for as a coach when I'm watching videos or in person is I'm looking for back angle change mm -hmm. on the pause. Yeah, you're practicing the hip drive. You're practicing Firing out drive. of the hole. Exactly right. And so that if you relax your hamstrings to pause, your back angle you're will done. become more vertical and you'll cut out your hip drive. So instead, you have to stay bent over, you have to maintain the back angle, and then fire up after two seconds. So I really like a pause squat. Obviously, you can't use as much weight. It also sort of breaks up that eccentric, concentric chain. Mm. There's no stretch reflex down there at the bottom. There's no bounce. It makes it hard. So I like that. I like a box squat. I think a yep. box squat works just fine, especially for people, and it does the same thing as pause squat. It's just that you actually allow the box to take the weight for just about a second. So it's not a two second pause, I mean, it's only a half second. We go down and we just touch our rump on the box and then come back and up. And then fire up. We, we don't do the rock back thing. Definitely we do not rock back. However, we don't, we don't change all of our geometry nope. when we're on the box. But I do let the box take the weight. Yes. So there is a difference. Otherwise you're just using the box as a depth gauge. I'm just going down and touching the box and coming back up. That's not what it is. I actually have to sit on the box. But again, I don't want the back angle to change. I do right. not want the back angle to change, right? What a box does, it does let you tend to sit back a little more than you do. And I've studied this. I, I actually think a lot of people in the box actually allow the barbell to get slightly behind the midfoot. Yes. You can do that. And, and you, you can, can do go it. down exactly over your midfoot. And when you sit on the box and it squashes your hamstrings, yeah. you almost by necessity will rock back. back on your There's heels, almost nothing you can do about it. Right? And, but that works really well for people who tend to have a problem with squatting on their toes or on the ball right. of their foot. Which is most people. Almost nobody's on their heels. Like, right. You just almost never have that. Right. Or, so, well, I say almost never. One out of 20 people, sure. that's what you're going to have. Sure. I do really like a box squat. I like a pin squat. I think a pin squat set mm -hmm. about two inches above parallel is a horrible place. I mean, it's a good, oh. it's where you want to do it, but it's brutal because it's that same idea as a rack pull, like you're in no man's land. So, yeah, so what you do is you, you set those pins about two inches so that the bar sits in the pins, the safeties in your rack when you're about two inches above parallel. And then, so you squat down and you let the pins take all the weight Yep. and then, and then fire, fire up. back up. So you're, like you said, you're in the no man's land. That's the hard place. When you fail and grind, that's where you fail and grind. So you start the load in yep. the hard spot. It's miserable. Yeah. There's no stretch reflex. Your hamstrings don't really get stretched out. It's like a dead squat. Yeah, you're like, yes, it's a dead squat. Yeah. You're loose. Now, I'll tell you, I don't know if you want to call it a correction, but what I'll tell my clients is rather than letting the pins take 100% of the weight, I tell them to let, let it take two-thirds of the weight. And the reason I say that is because, and I don't even know if that's true, it's just the way I have them visualize. The it's it. because yeah. they'll go down, they'll sit it on their pins, and sometimes the bar will come off their yeah. back a little bit, and then they'll fire up into the bar. And so I want there to still be some weight on their back. You start to keep your shoulder blades back. That's exactly right. So that tight. there's a little yeah. bit of weight on so that you go down and pause on the pins and then fire up. And so, and you can actually do pin squats at various sort of heights. And so you could actually theoretically do them higher. I just, I tend to like a little, like two inches above parallel seems to be about That's right. Nightmareville. Yeah, it's horrible. Wow. And so, and then the last one I use for primary one that I use for squats with most of my clients is the tempo squat. I like tempo as mm -hmm. well. I have just started using those more often because I think it helps people control the squat in a better sort of place. And so again, with a tempo, like three second eccentric, no pause at the bottom and like three second concentric, and it's hard. A six second rep is hard. You can't mm -hmm. do as much weight, some additional stress. It's a big help to have a partner in those, by the way. It is. Yeah. To kind of count, you know, in your ear while you do it. So those are the four big ones I like for squats. Now here's the other one that I actually like maybe more than any of the other ones. It's chain squats. Okay. I like chains on the bar, but yeah. the problem is- So much fun. They're awesome. The problem is that nobody has them. Yeah. And so chains are expensive and they're hard to come by. I mean, if you get lucky, sometimes you get lucky on Craigslist, like I think you did, and Man, I got you get a bunch of cheap chain, but yeah. it's, um, you know, you wanna buy five eighths inch chains. So that's the actual diameter of each individual link. Each link is a great big giant link. Those will be about six feet long, somewhere in there, right? I've got two set. I got mine from Rogue, 
and the rogue ones, they're probably not six feet. They're probably about five. And okay. I weighed them, and they're 17 pounds a section. Yeah, that's kind of funny because they, they say 20 on yeah, the No, that's they're... the same ones I had. So the exact same thing. There's like 17, 17 and a half. And so it's what probably you'll... three links difference between 20 pounds. Yeah. Because they're that. And one link probably weighs a pound. Sure. That's probably about right. So what you'll do, the reason we do chains, first off, what you'll do is you'll take usually a thinner chain, a small chain, a thin chain that is, I don't know, it's probably, it's also probably what? It's like the one off your swing set. Yeah, I like, mean, it's, and it's five, six feet yeah. long, right? And you connect a carabiner to it and it's a leader chain and you put that leader chain on the barbell and then you put all this heavy chain, you fold it over itself and you hook it into the leader chain and it hangs. We'll post a picture on it on the show notes. And then if each chain is, let's say it's 20 pounds for easy math, right? Right. We put three chains per side, so that's 60 pounds per side. So it's 120 pounds in chain. And I have, let's say I have 300 pounds on the bar. When I stand up at the top, there's 420 pounds on my back. There's 300 pounds of bar weight, and there's 120 pounds of chain. And there's one or two links of chain on the ground already. So the yeah. chain isn't swinging up that's, in the that's air. That's key. It's a safety issue. Yeah. Make sure it's yep. there on you the got ground. It. So there's a little bit of chain on the ground. And as I squat down... The chain continues to pool on the ground and deloads the amount of weight that's on my back. So at the bottom of my squat, probably 60, 70% of that chain weight is deloaded off of the bar. So now I have 300 pounds on the bar, but I only, instead of 120 pounds of chain on my back, only have 40 pounds or 50 pounds of chain on my back. So it's like 350 at the bottom. So your load is dynamic. Right, and 420 at the top. And so what it does is it actually works the strength curve. You know, most of us can quarter squat more than we can full squat. Yeah. And so it allows you to work that full strength curve so that the amount of time that it takes to perform a rep at maximum intensity, trying as hard as you can, slows it down. So most of us, when you come firing out of the hole, you'll fire out of the hole out of the stretch reflex, you slow down in the middle, and then you get towards the top, and your leverage gets better, and the weight speeds up again at the top of the squat. Well, with the chain, it just all goes slow. Yeah. All the way to the top. Yeah, you're stronger at the top, so there's more weight on you at the top. Yeah. So it, the whole damn rep is hard. Yeah, the whole the, rep is the is consequence. Hard. So that's when I say it works the strength curve. That's what I mean. So it's working this curve of the fact that, like, maybe I can only squat 75 pounds more in a quarter, I can squat 75 pounds more in a quarter squat than I can in a full squat. Well, I can adjust for that with the chain yep. so that I'm essentially performing movements at exactly 85% or 90% or 95% of true intensity through the entire range of motion of the lift, not just in a specific point of the lift. And it sounds great. It's, oh, fun. it's, it's fun. It's fun. Yeah. If you can get the chain, it's a great tool for late, intermediate, and beyond. Yeah. So you can order those at Rogue. Shipping, you know, shipping's kind of high. I think it, I just said Brett gets some. He got them in this week. And I think he got, oh, I think man. He got like, four sets or something. So it ended up costing like a pound. Yeah, it ended up costing like 300 bucks. So I'd, I'd say you plan to spend between two and 300 bucks on some chain. Look on uh, Craigslist. Certainly, if you live in like a port city like Baltimore or something like that, I mean, you, you probably get a real good chance of getting them for cheap. Right. You know, you're liable to find some for 50, 60 bucks, but they're nice to have as an intermediate. So. So that's squat, squat, supplemental lifts. Would you consider a beltless squat a supplement lift? Sure. I mean, that is a very, a beltless squat is a very specific mm -hmm. squat, right? So certainly. It's harder. Of course it's harder. Yeah. It's harder. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Of course. And what about your safety bar? Yeah, bars all the time. I use those all the time. I just, and I like them. They don't carry over quite as well. It's a high bar squat, typically. It is know? kind of a high bar squat. You know, we try to push those handles up and get Correct. the bar a little lower in your Take back. Take some pressure off your shoulders. We want it to look like the low bar squat. Correct. But we just can't quite get it there. Again, the question is, why do I not use the safety squat bar for my supplemental lifts very often? Well, almost none of my clients have it. Right. And so there's some of those things. Like, I mean, I, I like a buffalo bar slash duffalo bar. I mean, I think any of those are fine. Again, you're looking at the specificity. How specific is a buffalo bar squat to what we do? It's actually pretty specific. I mean, it's just a slight curve to the bar. Just like a, just like a squat without a belt is pretty damn specific. Mm -hmm. Whereas a safety squat bar is going to be significantly more different. Yeah. A box squat is going to be quite a bit more different. A tempo squat is just going to basically make things really, really hard, but it's the same sort of squat, right? A front squat is really different, yeah. right? A leg press is not a supplemental lift. It's off the reservation. Yeah, so that's squats. Okay, let's go to deadlift. Deadlift. I don't like very many on the deadlift. Yeah, we have less, less. Like fewer in our toolbox. Well, I don't know that that's even true. Like, again, because of my West Side day, so really this idea of supplemental lifts or variations in the lift, I learned from Louie at West Side, and they had tons of these. Now, remember, they would even do things like good mornings 
mm-hmm. would be their supplemental lift. It's just a good morning is not a supplemental lift. That's an accessory movement based yeah. on the way we're defining it, which is doesn't look house, anything like looks a deadlift. nothing like a deadlift, yeah. right? And so um, bars up on your back, and it's it also doesn't look anything like a squat. Louis thought that it was a supplemental lift for both the squat and the deadlift, and I can understand why it'd be an accessory movement for, for both of those. But for a deadlift, I really like a low deficit. That's my favorite. So like a one inch deficit deadlift, one and a half inch, two inches absolute max. And the reason I like that longer range of motion, but not too much, is because at one inch, it makes the range of motion one inch longer, which is actually more than you think. Yeah, it's at the worst part. It's Because it's at the worst part. But because it's only an inch, it doesn't change your back angle that much. And so it seems to carry over well. There have been a lot of guys from the past, powerlifting from the 70s, 80s, 90s, who really like like a three-inch deficit, yeah, yeah. four-inch deficit. I just would argue that it changes the back angle too much. I also like a deficit better than a snatch grip deadlift because to me, a snatch grip deadlift changes two major variables. It changes both the range of motion and where the grip is. So the grip, if you've ever done a snatch yeah. grip deadlift, so a snatch grip deadlift is going to change the back angle. That's right. Right, to make the range of motion longer. Angle of attachment for the lat. Yeah, and so everything is different in the upper body as well. So with a deficit deadlift where I'm standing on an inch of mats, two mats, two little half-inch mats, then everything else is exactly the same. It's just the range of motion is longer. And so I really like a deficit. I like a deficit for people who struggle to pull the weight off the floor quickly, properly. They lose back extension, mm. anything that kind of goes poorly with the weight off the floor, I like doing a deficit because now it makes it even harder off the floor. And then when we go to pull off the floor normally, then all of a sudden you go like, well, this is way easier because I'm in it a is. better position. I can breathe a little better. Like everything's easier. So I really like a deficit. I really like rack pulls. I love rack pulls. I like rack pulls just below the tibial bump, just below that tibial plateau, tibial tuberosity. Mm-hmm. Two inches below your knee. No, nah, three just, inches below your I kneecap. usually say three, and then when they do it, they're still an inch too high. So maybe it's four inches below the knee, somewhere in there. So upper mid shin, rack pulls above the knee are a waste. Yeah. Your leverages are too good. You still want to make sure when you set up with a rack pull, you set up just like you would a deadlift. At the point that you pull a rack pull, your shoulders are still going to be slightly in front of the bar. If you can get to the point where you can. Well, you say it's just like the deadlift, you're closer to the bar. We set up in our deadlift, our shins are an inch away when we're standing. Yeah. And you're doing the rack pull, like, you know, you're half an inch or even Okay, maybe. but you're exactly right, except that's exactly where it would be on a normal deadlift at that point. Right. Right, so you're exactly right. So what I do, I don't walk on a rack pull forward until my shins are an inch from the bar. I walk forward until my shins touch the bar. Yeah. So that my yeah. shins are at the point where the rack pull, I'm pulling the rack pull, my shins are vertical at that point because that's where they're going to be when the bar is at that height, if I'm pulling a regular deadlift, right, my knees will extend and go back a little bit, right? So my shoulders will be slightly in front of the bar. If you've never done a rack pull from this position, I'll tell you right now, it's a shorter range of motion. And you're like, man, I'm going to deadlift a lot more. I'm going to rack pull a lot more than I deadlift. And you end up deadlifting about 75 pounds less. It's hard. It's hard. Now you can get good at it. And I've seen, you know, you get to the point where you get more efficient at it and you will eventually probably pull. 50 pounds more or 75 pounds more on, on that mid shin rack pull than you can do from the floor once you get efficient and good at it. But in the beginning, you're again, you're in no man's land out there. There's no tightness, yep. nothing stretched. Your hamstrings aren't stretched. Nothing's tight. You're just kind of in this spot where you're just, everything's kind of loose. It's really hard to get tight. And so the other thing you've got to do on these rack pulls is you often have to strain for four or five yeah. seconds to get the bar to break off the pins. It takes a long time, so be patient with that thing because you could compress everything in your body. You've got to compress everything, and most of us are normal population, and we don't have a great rate of force development, right? So that's a genetic thing. If your vertical jump is 42 inches, and virtually nobody who's listening to us has a vertical of 42 <laughs> inches. Are you saying our, our <laughs> people are sl- uh, sluggardly? Yeah, yeah, probably. Probably that's what I'm saying. You know, people who are real explosive are going to make that bar move a little faster. Yeah. And those of us that are, that are slower, it's going to take a longer time to go from pulling. It feels like you're pulling 100% on that bar, yeah. but you're not. It takes a while to actually go from pulling zero to pulling 100%. Sometimes it takes like five seconds to pull. Yeah. And then, so you'll pull, you'll pull, you'll pull, you'll pull. You feel like, oh man, my face is going to explode. So much pressure. And then all of a sudden the bar starts moving. And as soon as it starts moving off the pins, it usually goes it up pretty fast. Yeah. yeah. Because your leverages get better quickly. So. It teaches the grind. It's yeah, good. it does. Those are my two favorite deadlift variants. The other two that I use that I really like, again, I really like deadlift with chains. Uh, as a matter of fact, I definitely like deadlift with chains better than a rack pull, 
because it does what we're trying to do on a rack pull, but it right. does it with a full range of motion. Again, most people don't have chains, but if you do have chains, man, chains on a deadlift are excellent, right? The only thing I hate about it is like setting that deadlift down without putting it on the chain. Yeah, it's a pain in the butt. So you've got two options. You can actually put it inside the collars, close to your hands, close to your feet, right. but just outside your hands and feet. And that will sometimes, or what I'll do is I'll actually put it at the end of the collars on the outside yep, and try to gather it up. So yeah, deadlift with chains, rarely can you do more than like two reps per set when you deadlift chain because eventually the chain is going to work its way underneath the weights and you're going to set it down on the chain and it's going to roll funny. Yeah, That's the one thing that's kind of a pain in the butt. And then I like paused deadlifts. I like to pull a deadlift mm. to mid shin, about four inch of four inches of pull, pause, and then pull and finish the lift. So you're not halting there. You, I mean, a halting one, right? They pull it halfway and then set it down. And set it back down, which is fine as well. But I just, I like to finish the lift. You've already so, got it off the ground. It's not a great deal of additional work to go ahead and lock it out correct. actually at that point. Correct. I think. And I've yeah. used other things. I've used isometric, isotonic lifts. Oh, yeah. Listen, I did some lifts years ago. I, me and one of my training partners at Strong, we would load the bar up and we would actually pull it from the floor and we would pull it to the spot where you would do a halting deadlift and we'd pull it and put the pins in the rack. So you pull it to the bottom I'd pull of it the to safeties. the bottom of the safety Ugh. pins and pull against the safety pins for three seconds. Three, two, one, and then set it down. Dude, those are terrible. They're so hard, uh, but I liked them. It, it works. You know, yeah, it works. And then we've also done them too where you kind of do a, a rack pull that way. So you, you set your rack pull up about a, a two inches lower than we were talking about earlier. So like two inches below the tibial bump. Mm -hmm and then put the pins just below the kneecap, and you just pull from the bottom pins to the top. So if you have two sets of safety pins, and so the bar is sitting on the safety pins, you go from the top of one safety pin to the bottom of the next one. It moves about three inches, right. three, four inches, and then you just hold it. This is brutal. It's like clang. Yeah. Clang. So I'm not, by the way, I'm not telling people to do that. I don't know that I've, <laughs> actually, I, I know for a fact that I've never programmed that for any of my clients. I saw one of those isometric York squat yeah. racks the other day on Craigslist. You know, the Did one you that's really? Like, oh, yeah. I would have bought that. It was in, um, I was in like Dodge City or something. Oh, okay. You know? Man, if you ever seen one I would have bought it in Tulsa, yeah. Yeah, but yeah. It looked like a squat rack, but the rails are like, I don't know, nine inches apart really or close. something. You, uh, you would move that bar up and down in between those and just, you weren't it really using it for a rack. It. You were just using it for a block to pull yeah. your, put your bar against. You'd squat up against a pin or yeah. deadlift against a pin like that, like he was talking about. Yeah, so the interesting thing, the story, I don't know if you know the history behind this, but that came out essentially the year that Diana Ball was invented. <laughs> No, for real. <laughs> right. Oh, it's great. So in the John Fair book, Muscle Town USA, you can read about this. It's so interesting. Right. So Bob Hoffman, who is a charlatan, just, you know, just a, just a mess. All these guys that were on the New York barbell team, they had all put on like 40 pounds of body weight and they got super, super strong. And he's like, it's from the isometric isotonic machine. That's <laughs> right. what it's from. And of course, lo and behold, they were eating Diana ball, like, you know, like they were Pez. And it wasn't illegal at the time. Like, right. it, you know, it just been, it Doc, yeah, Doc Ziegler had just invented it. And so that's the guy that actually invented Diana Ball, who, who got the idea of like processing formulating this from the Soviets. He tested it on the York barbell guys. They were the very first guys <laughs> in all of the world to ever have Diana Ball. So Diana Ball is an anabolic steroid. And so, yeah, so probably their progress was due more to the steroids that they were on and right. less to the isometric sort of work. Star told a story about some university in the town that he was lived in had some of those isometric yeah, under racks. the risers yeah, under the risers yeah. in the, and he yeah. talked about like sneaking in at night and like jumping over the fence I to totally use that equipment that, that so. guy would break in to work yeah you know yeah like that's how yeah, they, they were under the football was. stadium so that's deadlift let's go to press and bench press that's pretty fast too presses that with there's a least amount for press yeah there's very few that i think carry over well for press and so my favorite by far are pin presses standing yeah. pin presses now i actually use different heights so I primarily use pin presses from the forehead height or kind of the top of the forehead or the top of the head. I like them there. So you put the bar on the pins, you press overhead. Now this creates some problems yeah. for some people because a lot of you guys can't press inside your rack. I've got the pins that go inside the rack, but I also have the catch safeties that go outside the rack. Yeah, the spotter arms. Yeah, the is spotter, what they arms, spotter arms. Yes, thank you. And I'll put them on the spotter arms that stand outside the rack and put them on the spotter arms. And that's yeah. what most of my lifters do. So you set do. the spotter arms up high and the bar is like maybe your hairline high or something like that. And you get your feet underneath that thing. And you're again, you're loose. Yep. You're There's in no, no man's land. And you just got to get tight and lock that thing out. And we normally press it out a high percentage of our one rep max on those. Yeah. Tri a lot of triples there. And so I like those. I like them from eyeball height as well, which is lower. 
And I also like them for like a three to four inch lockout. So, you know, three, four inches above the head. Kind of depends on when you're failing, right? Like you watch a guy's press and you're like, mm, we're going to work the lockout. Or... Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And also if you're working it at the eyeballs, it's just very stressful. And if you're working it for just the last three, four inches of lockout, you're also trying to acclimate somebody from handling like way heavier weight than they can <laughs> actually do. So if you're only locking out, the barbell's only moving three or four inches then a lot of times you're doing 50 pounds over what you could actually right. do. So I like those. I actually like press starts, which is tough to use in the way we're talking about using them in a four-day split program because press starts usually occur. So a press start is basically you do it after your normal pressing. So you press, so you work up and your press weights are like 205 and you're hitting for some triples. And you're, you're already tired. You're already tired. Your one rep max is, let's see, you're hitting 205 for a triple and your one rep max is 225. You put 230 on, you put five pounds over your max on, you take it out of the rack, you walk back, you give it the big throw, you throw it as high as you can, you grind on it, and One, it grinds two, just as long as you can, and three. it falls back down, yeah. right? And then you rack it, and then maybe you do one more, one more single. So I might do two singles of press starts, take them out of the rack again, you'll rest four or five minutes, take it out of the rack again, step back. And I'm basically going to attempt a, one, a new one rep max. It's a little more than I, yeah. I, I'm virtually positive that I can't press it. You wrote a, uh, like a high, low max effort like yeah. powerlifting program is based on some, I guess, some old movie stuff or something, yeah. I guess. And you had those, you had them teamed up, right? You were doing pin yep. presses. And then like next week we would do like press starts. Yep. And then the week after that we do pin presses. Yep. And after about three cycles of the pair, you would go, almost every person that tried that program would put weight on the bar for a press start. Was, and then they would log out the yeah, press start press after doing three sets of yeah, five would, at like 90 points. Yep. They would hit PR. They so were really like, miraculous. But then they'll kill you. So oh. <laughs> there's, you, you only seem to be able to do them for about four or five weeks. And then if for whatever reason, it's just that really heavy weight on your body just ends yeah. up wrecking your body. And so it works for, uh, you know, yeah, alternating back and forth every other week for six weeks. So you would do it three times, about three times in a row. And so it actually would work really well for people there. I, th I think those are so illustrative of the idea of the supplemental lift. So, you know, we train the top of the press with our pins, pin, pin presses, presses, our lockouts. Then we train the bottom of it. Yep. Because a full range of motion at that weight's too heavy. We can't do it. So you do top half, bottom half, top half, bottom half, and eventually we put it all together and we get a big PR out of it. Yeah, it works perfect. Yeah, right. you're right. It's a, it's a perfect picture. Those are the two main ones I use. Um, I talked to Jordan about this not long ago. He's actually been doing some chain presses, which I've never had anybody do. I was just thinking, I was just but it would be interesting this. to do that, or chain pin presses, You're doing chains off the pins. So it puts mm -hmm. the pins at a relatively low spot, like again, the eyeballs, and then, uh, or, I mean, puts the barbell at the eyeballs and then connects chain to the bar. You know, I think that would make sense, like, at your regular height. That we don't have to walk out the chain Correct. with them dragging on the floor. Just a regular, at yeah. your regular rack position. Yeah, so, yeah. Yeah, because walking it out with yeah. the chain is kind Ooh, of yeah, I got to do that. Pain, I like it. But mm. I actually like standing heavy dumbbell press. Yeah. But again, a lot of my clients don't have access to dumbbells, yeah. especially if they train at home. I think a standing dumbbell press, especially start from a strict start, at, you know, at the bottom, carries over well to, to barbell press. Let me tell you what I don't like. I don't like push press. <laughs> No, because once you get it in there, it's like a tumor, it's man. It's too hard to get out. I mean, do I think a push press is a valuable exercise for like triceps and lockout strength? I do. I just think that the negatives outweigh the positive. And so, yeah, I, I totally agree. So I'm not a big push press fan. Same thing for push jerk. I mean, push jerk is just not, it's a full body lift and it's too, yeah, I'm just not going to use it. So there's just a handful of press exercises that I use. And we have the analogous ones for the bench press, right? We're going to do um, press lockout, the bench do, press lockout. Do pin presses, right? No bench press. You could do, a paused press, you just half the range. I, I actually, I really like a long pause on the chest bench press. So I do a two second pause bench mm. press off the chest. And I'll often do those with a slightly wider grip. If the person's shoulders are totally healthy, no problems with their shoulders, I haven't widened their bench press grip by about one inch. And then come down and they'll pause for two full seconds. One, 1,000, two, 1,000, boom, fire mm. up. If they do those long pauses like that, same thing for squats. I never have them do more than three reps. Mm. Pause a lot of time under tension. Yeah, it's too, it's too long. So I do like a little bit of a pause bench press, a close grip bench press, just elongates the range of motion, right? So it's going to put more moment on the elbow, right? A lot, a lot of tricep. Yeah, a lot of tricep. I like a floor press, I like a pause floor press. So floor press. Floor press is scare the shit out of me. Why is that? Uh, you can't really get hurt on them. Uh, I don't know. Because what if you miss? They're so much safer than bench press if you well, miss. Th that may be. The I bar know, I'm just always face. worried. That, you know, I'm gonna, I, don't, I don't know. I just, I just have oh, yeah, these like, visions of just gonna, like slapping your, my, yeah, my forearm, your forearms. Yeah, yeah. You so. With a floor press, you've got to bring the bar down slow and in control. Yes. You come down. But also, by when the time you're doing a floor press, really, even females, you but certainly males, well, not only 
that, but it's like you've got big old thick triceps. Yeah. So your elbows don't really touch the ground. Like when I'm doing a floor press and I come down, my triceps are the thing that's touching the ground. My triceps are thick enough that my elbow really never touches. I mean, I'm sure if I came down and slammed it on the ground, it would. And so, so do you prefer the floor press to using the pin on the bench press? It's yeah, the same I'd thing. I'd say that's true. I do. You prefer it to it? I, you know, and then you've got things like board it's, presses. It's like a box or, squat almost. It's kind of, it is like a box squat, and it puts you in no man's land. Again, anybody who's good at bench press from a form perspective, nobody misses a bench press right off the chest. Mm -hmm. Everybody can throw weight off their chest. And where you miss is right at where that floor press is. So you mm -hmm. bring it down, you pause it, you're in no man's land, and you just, you got to lock it out. So I, I like a floor press. I like a paused wide grip bench press. I like a close grip bench press. I do like low pin presses. I do, especially low pin press. I like yeah. them much better than higher pin presses. Low pin press, like a, an two, inch two to two inches chest. off the chest. I really like those. If people have boards or like I've got the Elite FTS as a, a pad, a bench pad mm. that you can attach to the barbell and do kind of partials. I'll tell you my favorite one for bench press, slingshot. <laughs> I like slingshot. You know why? Yeah, it's cheap. It's easy to Widely get. Widely available, you know. And you can very much overload the lift. You can. Right? Now, you got to be careful. Tom Capitelli had one of his best lifter, Moon. She was benching with real heavy slingshot. And, you know, no problem. I think she had to do a set of three. And did the first one, no problem. Did the second one, no problem. And threw the third one right on her face. Mm. And uh, yeah. thought it broke her jaw. They had to take her to the emergency room. And yeah, um, I, I think it changes the mechanics of the lift a little bit. Well, what would be a better option than a slingshot? Chains. Chains. <laughs> this is going to be the... I bet I could get myself a free pair of chains from like <laughs> pipping these chains out all the time. I need to, yeah. I need to put in the show notes where to buy chains. And yeah. I'll call Rogue and be like, well, I'll Look, do that. I'll do that. You guys sell 20 sets of chains to our listeners. I get a pair. I want master. some sets, man. Yeah. Cause I don't, I don't. So it's one of the things I lost. We had 600 pounds of chain mm. at Strong Gym. And then when I sold Strong, I it was one of the things I lost. So yeah. So certainly a better variation than slingshot is chain, but yeah. a slingshot costs you what, like 40, 40 sure. bucks or something like that. Put it in your gym bag, take it to the gym and go change are going to cost you 300 bucks and so but the same thing yeah so we just you know bring it down and and pause and fire up i did those with brett mckay today i taught him how to do those today at his house and uh, they worked well so i think that's it on those supplemental lists obviously there are other supplemental lists that will work just the longer i do this the more i see that there are less that i think carry over right as well as we want them to and so i don't know that we said it this way maybe you can't squat super heavy every session so we can take a little weight off the bar essentially complicate, not, I don't want to complicate, but it just makes it a little hard. handicap the lift, right? We sure. can put a pause on the back of it. Yep. And so you're moving less weight. So your yep. joints aren't getting beat up as yep. much because it's less weight, but it's still really damn hard. Sure. So it's a hack, you yep. know, it's a pause squats, work. tempo squats, things like that. It's That's just, what all these things are. They're all lighter lifts. They just make it harder. Or you do something like a rack pull or a chain lift or something like that. And it overloads the weight. And so right. now what's amazing is it allows you to, to lift heavier weight, certainly get stronger. What's interesting is that if you're, let's say your bench press, all-time best bench press is 300 pounds, and you get to the point where you're handling 335 and chains at the top, so it's mm. 335 and chains at the top, and it's like 275 at the bottom, and it's a real hard rep, it's 335, right? Well, how heavy is 305 going to be in your hand to try a new PR? It's awesome. You take yeah. it out, it's 305, you're like, well, listen, I've handled 30 pounds more than this. This doesn't feel heavy to me. So it's, it's a lot of about confidence with those overlifts. What do you call a squat walkout? Yeah, I do that too sometimes. A squat walkout to me is the same thing as a press start. So I can't program a squat walkout as its press own. Start. So let me tell you why. Because it's an overload movement that I have to put after this main thing. So a squat walkout yeah. you would put in after regular competition Switch squats. shares that with the pause squat. So what it is, guys, like let's say your squat max is 400. Yep. Let's say we'll put like 475 maybe on the bar and you just get tight under it pick it up out of the hooks, you step it out like you're going to squat and you just stand there for, for five seconds, I am 10. Yeah, or 10, and five then, And then sure. walk that thing in. And it, man, it is astounding how much stress that places on you. So you're getting some stress. You're learning how to get tight. You know, we contract isometrically harder than we do in any other way. So you get super isometric contraction against that load. And then we also are getting used to handling that big, heavy yeah. weight. And so you walk out 475 and 405 feels a whole lot better next time. So I love those. Yeah, They're really me useful, it's me, especially me. Like I just, I don't know, I panic and choke and screw up on yeah. heavy squats so much. And they've been a big help for me. And uh, big, heavy bench press handoffs too. You just put something super heavy sure. in your hands and then yeah. have your spotter rack. Yep. Those are, yep. All those are perfectly fine.
and they don't stretch out too much, but it's more for mental sort of stuff. You get you get that stuff on your back, and you know you put four seventy five on your back if your best squat is four hundred pounds, and you go to a meet, and you try for a four twenty squat, four twenty five, and you've had four seventy five on your back, four twenty five, and you're like, this is no big deal. You've at least trained the walkout part. Yeah, so I can remember the first time I squatted six hundred at a meet, I took six hundred out of the rack, and I was like, holy shit. This is really, a matter of fact, the first time when I was a geared lifter, which I'm not proud of those days, by the way. <laughs> well, everybody did it. It's like Every, the time everybody was doing it. I played it. for the other team. The first time I took 800 pounds out of a monolift, because that's what you do when you're a geared power lifter, I stood up with 800 pounds in my full squat suit and I went, nope. And I said, pull the rack back in. I just set it back on the floor, back in the rack, because it was so heavy. As a matter of fact, I did the same thing when I was doing the yoke and I was learning how to do strongman. The first time, actually, it was also 800. Some of that 800 number, 800 on your back's real heavy. And mm. so now, one of my pro card in strongman, we got to the point where the heaviest yoke run I did as a pro strongman was 930 pounds. That is heavy, dude. 930, I think it was for 75 feet. And I think you only got one put down. So you could set it down one time. You put it down again, that marked you in distance. And so I can remember the first time I stood up with 800 pounds on a yoke. So for those of you guys who don't know what a yoke is, it's basically just like a big like squat bar. It's how would you? It's, you know, you guys have seen it, like they pick up the motorcycles on both sides of them or right. whatever. You do a little quarter squat to stand up with the thing and then you run down the street with it. It's just super healthy for your hips and knees and right. ankles, right? And uh, I can remember the first time I stood up with 800 pounds. I stood up and went, no, screw this. <laughs> Set it back down, yeah. put it on the ground. Didn't take one step. So yeah, anyway. Yeah, when you walk out 475, I'm not a giant squatter. I was like, I couldn't believe the pressure on the bottom of my feet. Yep. It didn't hurt. You're just yep. like, damn, the yep. pressure on the bottom of your feet is astounding. Yep. I can't even imagine 800. Yeah, yeah. So if you're listening to the episode and you are not an intermediate, <laughs> and you're not a mid intermediate, you should not be doing this lifts. Right. There's one of those things that we were talking about that you could go faster than like, can you get benefit from these lifts earlier intermediate for phase while. for a little while? Yes. But you had dues that you should have paid earlier to get yourself to the point to be able to use these. And by the time you get to the point where you need to use them, Certainly, your coach will know if you're coached, and you should be coached by somebody, whether that's an in-person coach or an online coach. But even for yourself, by the time you get here, you'll clearly know the places in the list that you need to work on, like where you're failing. Are you weak at the lockout? Are you weak halfway up? Like, where do you need to work? And so you don't know those things when you're early intermediate. And right? you need to build some work capacity before you start adding these yeah. things in. You really do. So don't use this stuff unless you absolutely have to. Um, but when you need to, man, they're great friends. They are, great yeah, friends they're, to have. they're nice to have that card to play. It's just like when people start trying to diet, you know, in the beginning and, and they say, hey, I want you to do a nutrition program for me. And I do minimum effective dose and I give them like the one step, the great for the biggest return on right. investment. They go, whoa, whoa, I thought I was going to be eating chicken breast and broccoli and doing cardio five days a week and taking thermogenics <laughs> and all those. And I go, whoa, whoa, hold on. So we just set you up so you did, can't eat ding dongs. We now. did all those things you would lose a whole bunch of weight in right. like four weeks. So this is a great analogy to what we're saying. You would lose a whole bunch of weight in four to six weeks. And then when the weight stops, what am I going to do? Because I gave you everything, right? So that's the idea. I want to milk, after linear progression, I want to milk Texas method or Texas method variance for as long as I can, have that medium as long as I can. And then when I move that four-day split, which is no reason to jump right into that from linear progression, right? then I can start to introduce these supplemental lifts. And in the beginning, I want to introduce supplemental lifts are the closest to the main lift. So the most specific to the main lift. And as I go on and become more advanced, it can handle more variation. It's not going to throw off my motor patterns that I can do things that are a little more different. Yeah. You know, our goal isn't just to get the strongest. It's also to get strong for a long time. You yeah. Know, no injuries. You right. know, it's a long, smooth career. Even if you don't compete, you're having a, a career as a strength athlete. So we want to make that long. And so using these things judiciously helps us do that. I think we've killed this one. Thanks for listening. Mm-hmm.